It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to say a few words just to start off um, about this area because it's a, it's a topic that, as we know, has been around for a long time. It's just that I think the computational power of, the, of what we have now has made uh, the applications be really uh, endemic and systemic. Um, I started out in this world, and I'm going to, let's see, yeah, go to a couple slides here. Uh, studying um, what we called artificial neural networks. It really started in the 70s when I was at Stanford, um, adaptive signal processing by Bernie Woodrow. And actually, I think the first applications at scale for artificial neural networks was done by a student who was in my class who came up with a noise canceling algorithm uh, based on neural, neurally inspired properties for cauterizing knives in the emergency room when folks would have open heart surgery, actually the electromagnetic radiation was so strong that it actually would knock out all the instrumentation and you were actually you know, monitoring the patient based on their pulse and, and blood pressure. So that wasn't too effective and he came up with a way to, to do that. This was work came a little bit later with one of my students, Ram Swami, and we looked at a problem that in the 90s, uh, before there was a vaccine, which was cervical cancer, at the time, cervical cancer was the largest um, killer of women in the developing world. And right now, it's the fourth um, most common cancer for women in, in, in the world. And one of the problems is that, that one pap smear on a slide would be 2.5 gigabytes of information. And you remember, this is the 90s, so this was like in the dark ages of IT. And there were 55 million pap smears done a year in the US. And people that screened them were paid by the piece. So the error rate was 30%. And I actually sat at a table, a bench, with some of the screeners. And they're moving so fast on these slides looking for cells that you actually get, you get sick, motion sickness. So the, um, in, about, in about 87, FDA said, no, there's got to be a secondary screener. And so individuals wanted to do this automated. So we took up this problem. And uh, it is, essentially it was 100 petabytes of data a year that needed to be screened. And we came up with a little algorithm, which we called the um, digital hit or miss transform on a cellular image. This is actual uh, data, so that's original slide on the left. And the interesting thing about a lot of the problems that are solved using artificial intelligence is that you can't really sometimes come up with the rules of why. You learn by experience. So doctors have a hard time telling you why they think it's a cancer cell. They just know it's, it's cancerous or not or needs to be treated. So in this particular cell on the left, Normal cells, it, it, um, you know, you see the uh, cytoplasm and everything in, in around it. The nucleus tends to be small and like a dot. But you have to be able to differentiate that from a speck of dust on the slide. Now, once that nucleus gets bigger, it starts to differentiate. You see in the middle that those are the slides where you have little white dots on them. Those are cancer cells. Now, the challenge is, if you try to solve this as an engineer without having expertise, which we finally did get a pathologist to join our research team, we found we were solving the wrong problem. And the reason why is if you look at a, a so-called receiver-operator curve for detection of cells or labeling on the left correctly, and it's about, it, it sort of taps off at about 80%, and then on the horizontal axis is the error rate and so we thought we had to find every single cancer cell on the slide. And on a slide which would indicate that a woman would need to be treated, there's about 40 cancer cells out of 100,000 cells. So it's truly a needle in a haystack type problem. So if you go after trying to find every single cancer cell, you find that your false positive rate, so those are cells that are deemed to be cancerous but are not, overwhelm the false negative, well, the uh, proper identification of the cancer cells. So if you've got 100,000 cells and you have a 1% false positive, that means that 1,000 images you're going to look at have been characterized as cancerous, but they're really not. Well, the pathologist only looks at 200 images. So you can see that that's not very helpful because you'll get all these false positives that the pathologist is looking at. So when we finally were educated to what the problem we should be solving is we looked just to have a 50% hit rate on properly identifying cancer cells. But that allowed us to get to a 0 .008 error rate on our false positives, which meant that at least 20 out of the 100 or so images that the physician pathologist was looking at indicated the need for treatment. 
So we actually then ended up selling this box. Uh, we built a little box and licensed it to Cytec Corporation, and then subsequently went public, and I think that they're still in business today. Um, we are not, but that was good. The PhD student got, got, was graduated, and that was the result. So that taught me something about the human-machine interface, that it's very important to have you know, a machine not be unsupervised, but it's also important not to have engineers unsupervised for one of the killer applications, which is really in the medical world. And so as we continue to think about the impact of this, so that's sort of one class of, of problems I think about, which is pathology, medical imaging. So the next class of problems, and this is maybe not the most um, pleasant looking slide, but this is something called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Has anybody heard of NSF before? So this was a particularly insidious disease. First of all, it never existed before 1987 or 88. And the reason why is it's a reaction from some people's genome, if you will, to gadolinium contrastation in MRIs. And actually, as we know, the MRI was developed and invented at SUNY. So, you know, in the 70s, late 70s when that came out, and then into the 80s and getting FDA approval, you started to see the contrast agent. So why was it so insidious? Well, this, first of all, it was fatal in 47% or almost half of the cases, so that was a problem. Second is it would express itself anywhere from six weeks to six months later. So the way it was found is there are five or six cases in one hospital. And from those five or six cases, a physician actually meticulously went through and found the indicators, which then did the matching. That put together, you know, sort of found the plot, right, and was able to diagnose this. And so um, that led to a change in the way that some of the contrast agents, fortunately, are done. But isn't that interesting? So here's a disease, fatal disease, but never existed before in modern technology. So that's another class of problems. And I think one of the advantages in the state of New York is they say in AI and in machine learning, they who have the most data win. So we have a very populous state. SUNY has probably, what, 9 million uh, <coughs> independent healthcare or distinct healthcare records, but the state of New York you know, must have doubled that or, or nearly. And so if we have the most data, think of the richness if we were to somehow create that, that healthcare cloud where our researchers throughout the whole state, the public and privates, could work together to look at trends and identify features and classify them. And so that's one aspect of you know, the applications of, of AI. But it turns out, as we know, right today, it's estimated that a, the AI um, uh, total addressable market is about a trillion dollars, and it's expected to quadruple in the next four years. So it's growing at what about 70% compound aggregate growth rate. If we think about the industries that are headquartered in the state of New York, there's over 50 Fortune 500 companies that call their headquarters here. SUNY, for example, educates a third of all degrees in higher education. So if we're going to prepare the workforce, it's going to drive this uh, economy is going to give this differential of about one trillion in GDP if we can harness AI, at, uh, similar to the way the steam engine made an impact on the economy, you know, 100 and some years ago. We need to have an educated workforce. So I think the two killer applications, and I know that Commissioner Reardon and, 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 and I've talked to all of us have talked about this, is we've got to be able to educate the workforce. So to me, the two killer applications would be healthcare and education. And so I'm not going to say too much more because I might have said already uh, enough, but I haven't looked and been able to talk about these slides since my PhD <coughs> student graduated in the 90s, so it was really nice for me. <laughs> um, but we have a lot of expertise, you know, so one of the things that we, we look uh, to a lot is that one of the first problems in the, it might be late 80s, 90s, that was solved was trying to sort billions of pieces of mail based on zip code or lack there of a zip code. That was actually developed at the University of Buffalo. Applications to precision med medicine, digital pathology, we talked about that, and, and others. So we have expertise at SUNY in AI, and we really want to apply it not only to develop more research technologies and spin-offs, but also to try and meet working with our colleagues across the state, the AI talent shortage, which we're definitely going to see. In fact, Throughout the whole country, 11% of the jobs in AI are posted in New York City for the entire country. So that is a challenge to all the universities in the state to be able to prepare and educate that particular workforce. So we're developing um, a um, New York Institute for Advancements in Artificial Intelligence. And I just want to point out with a couple quick slides, 
at least from the SUNY's perspective, and we, we can put all the colleges and universities throughout the state on this map, but it's geographically diverse, but it's also, in addition to geographically diverse, it's got a lot of data. So we've got you know, a million or more students in many locations, and we actually, when you look at this educational ecosystem, what I sort of stepped back and looked at is, it's a network <laughs> within a network, so we need to develop what we call SUNY Reloaded and move from institutional curriculum to institutional learning, and from knowledge in silos to network, a network ecosystem. And you know, this is a whole other talk, and I, I really don't have time, or else Jim will change the locks next door. So I'll just move on and say that I think the important thing is that we are a connected world, and if we can figure out how to connect our researchers, students, and, and staff to the data and network their applications in AI, that's gonna be a real win. So I'm just gonna flip ahead and just say, end with what we're sort of, for lack of a more imaginable, uh, imaginative name, the I Ecosystem Project, where we think about how we can collaborate across the state, create sort of an education ecosystem where all the information is in a place where people can go to, to access, access it, do research on it, and get trained so that we do continuous learning so that you don't find yourself after 10 years out of a job because you've been continuously upskilling as you go along this continuum. And that's what we hope to develop in terms of our individualized education and ecosystem work. So I think I'll just conclude with that. Say I'm super excited to hear from the panelists who actually know something about the most recent advances in this field and just really appreciate you all being here and can't wait for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor. I'd like to invite the first panel up. Good job, City. Hi there. I'm Steve Skeena, um, uh, uh, the director of the AI Institute at Stony Brook University, and we have uh, an exciting panel here today. Let me just give, quickly give names. The biographies are in the, um, you know, the handout. We've got Steve Hoover, who's the chief technology officer and corporate vice president at Xerox. Kimala Pras, who you've seen, president of the Rockefeller Institute, the Honorable Barbara Reardon, who's commissioner of uh, the New York State Department of Labor, and Ajay Rayuru, uh, uh, a vice, IBM fellow and vice president in the healthcare division at Watson's Research Labs at IBM. Um, so we're going to go through a series of questions, but uh, first we'll revolve around the opportunity for AI to encourage growth and improve lives. And I'd like to direct this to Steve Uber. Um, the question is, how is AI changing your business, um, especially manufacturing services, what new products and capabilities and business models is AI enabling for Xerox? Um, it, it is having a significant impact, and we're going to kind of talk about three different ways that uh, it's having a real impact in our, in our business. The first is actually um, embedding AI in the manufactured products, the devices themselves. So it was interesting to hear Dr. Johnson talk about the application of vision to detection in, in pathology for cell detection. So for example, actually, in our systems that we make, we have embedded real-time vision systems that are scanning the performance of the device in real time. A lot of data processing, a lot of artificial intelligence technologies to reduce that to understand how the device is performing. Because when you do that, you can break kind of a traditional trade-off between cost and reliability. Because that added intelligence of what's really happening in the machine in the real time, sensing that and feeding that back, allows you to make either more cost-effective devices that have the same performance, or to increase their performance. And so if you're, you know, so there's a lot of questions about AI and, and manufacturing and what it means to jobs. And one of the things that we're seeing is people who know how to make smart devices with the artificial intelligence embedded in them will be making those devices. And so it has a significant impact. In terms of, of, of um, service, um, it has a very similar kind of impact. Because again, this ability now, for example, we manage two million devices across the globe. And the ability to take data from each of those devices and understand what's occurring in real time. What's the state of that device? Is it functioning well for the customer? Isn't it? And to actually learn patterns over time that would predict failure. So we can proactively actually repair the machine before it breaks. 
or maybe send a signal to that AI inside of the machine about something that's going to break and change its performance so we don't even have to send a tech rep out. And so again, this ability to understand lots of data, to reduce it down to what, what it means to the operation of the device. These are the kinds of things that are really going to dominate um, um, devices in the future. And so when you think about the traditional skills of, of manufacturing things, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, well, right, we went through a revolution 30 years ago where, um, you know, for example, at Xerox, I have as many people writing software that control the device as I do mechanical and electrical engineers. And the same is true for automobiles and almost anything you know, that you buy today. Then we're going to see the same thing as artificial intelligence becomes embedded in, in, in those machines. Um, the, um, and embedded into the, into the technologies, how do I route service engineers to the right place? How do I optimally route the placement of, um, of, of service parts for them? So all of those technologies. So the third I want to touch on is um, actually in how you design things and, and, and how they're manufactured. So there's a lot of, um, we're, we're kind of through the hype cycle in 3D printing. So I assume most people are familiar with the idea of 3D printing. And it was this kind of backwater thing, overhyped. And if you're familiar with the Gartner Hype Circle, we're kind of you know, in the trough of disillusionment. But, <laughs> but coming out the other side, this is... This is a very, if you don't know it, it's really interesting to look at. It's a classical pattern for technology adoption. Um, we've seen the same thing for AI in the past. We'll see, we'll see that again here. But it's a predictable pattern. But the point is, one of the really valuable things about 3D printing is two things, right? One is I can print, I can make something in quantity of one. Normal manufacturing processes require many copies. Well, we know in today's world, people want customized, personalized things. That's what our digital lives have taught us. The other thing is, you can actually make things that you can't make any other way. Because if you think about, I want to make an object that has a complex hole inside of it. It goes down inside to the left, back up and to the right. Well, I don't, can't get a drill in and make that hole. But if I print the part, I can print that shape. And if you look at things, you know, look out at a tree, a structure of a tree. Very robust, right? It's like how slender, but how tough it is. Think of the root system. We don't design mechanical structures that look like that for a bunch of reasons. It's really hard to make. And we don't know how to design it. 3D printing, you can design things that you can't make that are more robust, that have performance attributes. But you can't design them because you don't understand how they're going to fail in the space that you want to explore. So we are developing actually artificial intelligence software techniques for the computer-aided design to then leverage that. And again, the people in the future who are going to dominate in manufacturing, where jobs are going to be, are going to be the people who understand those things and can develop that software, can develop then 3D printing systems, and who can make goods in that way. And so those are, these are real changes that are occurring that we're investing in and that we're seeing. Okay, very good. Okay, next question for Ajay. Ajay, how do you see AI transforming healthcare and healthcare delivery? <clears throat> Like uh, all industries that have gotten digitized, <coughs> AI is the next uh, change or transformation that these industries experience. And healthcare is uh, a very good example of that. We went from keeping records in doctors' heads to keeping records on paper to keeping records digitized. You know, we've seen all of that in the last several decades. And now we are at a point where the encounter of a patient with a physician actually leaving a digital record. But there's a used to be and there is a now, which I think is going to be different from what we will experience in the future. And this change, if we use AI properly, should allow us to experience this change. So let me just describe what the differences are. Just recall what was your last event at a physician uh, visit. You were poked and prodded, a whole bunch of stuff was collected from you. And hopefully, if that gets used properly, the next time you go to your physician, a fraction of that information gets reused. And I'm being generous when I say fraction. Okay, most often it is just a top page that gets reused. So digitalization actually is creating a record, but is not yet creating the reuse of that data in a manner that will benefit you 
and the decision that is being made about you. So that is the transformation that healthcare is expecting to make by using AI. So more specifically, how I think AI becomes relevant in healthcare is just being able to know what to measure. It starts from that. Okay, today, the way we practice healthcare, we teach our practitioners in school and through experience at the bedside that they had through years of residency and training, what to measure and how to use that information. And they become expert practitioners at it because of that. What we don't give them additionally are ways in which they can get information that they haven't gone and touched themselves. So does the system have more information than, than the ones that they have actually experienced at the bedside? And how did they use the rest of that information to actually make better decisions, right? So that's actually a gap in our curriculum today that all the schools are now trying to actually close that gap. Because the system has more experience than the, than the practitioner has. But how do we teach the practitioner when they are learning how to take advantage of all that data and all that learning that the system is having that they should actually be able to exploit, right? So that's number one. And AI has a role to play here because AI is actually peeking at the system. And AI can become an assistance to the learning experience where you're saying, look, these are all the five different things that even though you have not seen a patient like that, when the following three things occur, testing for this fourth thing will actually help you tell the difference between this and this. So that's an example of how AI can actually teach the resident or the, or the expert as they're learning what to look for beyond what they've already looked for or what they've experienced. That's number one. Number two would be in the decision making and the decision support itself, which is very much a data-driven uh, activity, right? So the transformation that is happening in healthcare is going from the expert or eminence-based decision making, which is how we, or at least people of my generation have experienced healthcare, is you go to the doctor and that you choose the doctor because you look it up and you find that, oh, this guy has actually treated a thousand people like me. <coughs> and therefore, somehow the eminence and the experience that is accumulated in having treated those thousand people is what makes me choose that doctor and then I'm actually delegating trust to that individual to make all the decisions for me. This changes from an eminence-based practice to an evidence-based practice where the practitioner is actually, because they're creating a digital trail of all this data, are constantly being given a decision support to actually make better decisions with data that they or others in the practice have seen before. So think of how many other patients similar to this one patient have been encountered in my healthcare system at that point in time, and what decisions were possible for them which ones were right and which ones are not? Could I treat them with option A? Could I treat them with option B? If I put this one patient on option A, what will the outcome be? So an AI system can actually begin to give you these sorts of insights. And you know, this is not science fiction, actually. You know, it's, it's possible already. And some of the examples that you saw uh, Dr. Johnson talk about in precision medicine are really about these, right? Where you can use this data to actually bring this kind of decision support. And then a third is actually in efficiency, right? So today, the way we exercise care or deliver care in uh, the, the uh, delivery of health uh, uh, care to our patient populations, we let them go look for whatever is the care that they need. And of course, there is you know, either overconsumption or inappropriate consumption. Uh, that occurs all the time because who wants to actually ignore conditions? They will go and look for other ways to do. So managing that to actually achieve better efficiency is not just throttling down how much of care is being consumed, but rather it is about what should be done at the right point in time for the right person. Done well, AI can actually give us insights through all this predictive modeling of how to shift from episodic at the point of acute need to something that is more in advance of that chronic condition becoming unmanageably difficult, okay? So can I forecast using AI? What are those difficulties that are likely to emerge? And because now we have evidence that can back all this up, we can say, so what are the things I could do to this diabetic individual 10 years before they actually have this catastrophic event that is occurring to them? 
right? And they're actually reducing the cost eventually because 10 years later, you don't have this catastrophic cost. And you're actually becoming more efficient in how you consume the delivery of care. So I believe with the same number of doctor visits, we can actually improve outcomes mm -hmm. by doing this more efficient way. That's not magic. That will require a lot of hard work. It will require us to use data from all the possible sources and build an ecosystem of participants, including the care delivery <coughs> individuals, the care management individuals, the insurers, and everybody, to actually be able to exploit these new insights that we are getting to actually transform the care, right? So those sort of examples where I see AI begins to change the healthcare uh, experience that, that we all have. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the second set of questions concerns AI in the work, workplace. Um, and uh, Commissioner Reardon, again, we've heard from Steve and Ajay about how AI is changing manufacturing and healthcare. Um, what does AI mean for the workplace? How is it changing the way people work and perceive work? So let me first say that, that this is a topic that frightens workers and frightens parents and frightens workers' representatives. Um, because the fear is that AI will replace people. And you hear that all the time. So I think the first thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge these wonderful examples that you've given of how AI actually enhances your life and enhances your workplace and can make your work experience better. Um, but it is, it is a massive change and this change will happen so much faster than change has ever happened before. So I, this is the point where I usually pull out my cell phone and go, this changed your life. Um, I came out of the world of entertainment, and before 2003, we bargained over film. In 2003, UCLA stopped teaching film production in their film school. Stopped. You could, you could learn it as an archival thing, but you didn't <laughs> learn it as a thing you do in the workplace. It was replaced by digital technology, and it happened like that. And I think these kinds of changes are going to happen even faster as we go you know, into this new world. But I think the first thing we need to do is help people understand that it is an opportunity and it's not, it's not going to make workers redundant. There are certainly kinds of work that will become less useful. Uh, it means that when we educate our workforce, we have to educate them to different standards and on different issues. Um, the, we talk all the time about how important STEM and STEAM you know, is to, to the, the new people coming into schools. You can't overemphasize it. And if you do not have some kind of education that allows you to interact with a computerized uh, workplace somehow, you're going to be left behind. And so we have a responsibility to think about everyone, we can't just say the kids who come from wealthy families will be fine because they'll be exposed. Because that means we're gonna, we're gonna reduce people who already live in poverty to unlivable situations. So it, it creates great challenges, but it creates enormous opportunities. And you think about uh, things that are currently done by hand with brute force that can be done by a machine. We've got decades, generations of, of you know, examples Let's celebrate it and not be fearful of it. I mean, um, the, the thing that always comes up is when we do career fairs, we always have at least four different companies looking for, for people with CDLs, with commercial driver's licenses, because everything is delivered by truck. And so it's, it's a deep need. And everybody in the AI world goes, why would you get anybody to get a CDL in 10 years? You won't need it. Between now and 10 years, there are, there, it's a crisis. So it's not just focusing on the AI, it's how do you get there? And for, for work, we, have, we do a little bit of triage in our career centers. They're the people who need a job right now regardless. They're desperate, they have to pay their rent, they have to feed their family. Uh, they're people who have some lead time to do a little bit of training, some upskilling, whatever. It's a short amount of time, maybe max 18 months. And then you have people who aren't in the workforce yet. And they have a long runway. But that runway is not 10 years, unless they're in grade school. And so you have to think about what, who are the, what's the audience for the work that you're planning for, and how do you help them make those steps so they don't get left behind as the information changes. The expectation of lifelong learning is absolutely crucial to, the, to this conversation. You can no longer expect to get 
a two-year degree or a four-year degree or even an advanced degree um, or an apprenticeship and never go back and learn more because it's going to change. No matter what you do, it's going to change. And we have to begin at the very beginning with young people saying, you are going to spend your life learning your tasks, learning your, your skills, learning your passion, but you are never going to stop learning. And that is also critical, not just for the worker, it's absolutely essential for the employer. Mm -hmm. Because employers right now tend to have an idea that, that the workforce is a vending machine. I put a quarter in and I get a fully formed worker out and I don't do anything. <laughs> Those days are gone. You know, that's just, that's not going to happen. So employers also have to understand, they have to invest in their workforce. That is as important to them as the steel that they build with or the you know, 3D printer that they create things with. That workforce is a vital part of, of their success. And, and it is a shared success. Workers are valuable. They are, not, um, they are not as fungible in an AI world as they may have been in a, in a raw labor world. You know, your muscles give out, you get somebody else with muscles. Um, this is a very different world. And so for employers to understand the value of an educated workforce, a continuing pathway of learning, and for a society to value those incremental increases in knowledge that everybody has to get, a real, and that's, I think that's a huge difference from what we do now. Interesting. Okay, next question for Jim. Um, what, what opportunity is AI creating for the labor market? The business world and industries are changing, the workplace is changing. What does this mean for jobs and especially for the state of New York? Doom. Add an utter doom. No, 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 no. I think to revert to everybody's point, first of all, I love 3D printing. We have a very successful 3D printing manufacturing facility in the North Country which is going gangbusters. So when we put our minds to something in New York, we get the plans. So I love the fact that we can take something and get out of that trough and do good things. Whether we like it or not, it's happening, right? That's always the thing. We don't want Napster to go online and digital music. We're gonna stop it. We can't stop what's going on. Innovation happens. The question is, how do you transition and harness it? Either we're gonna win the race economically, or China's gonna win the race or Europe's gonna win the race, or New Jersey. And we can't allow New Jersey to win the race. <laughs> That's the worst. That would be the worst situation. Mississippi, probably a close second, but New Jersey's pretty bad. Laura Schultz is our senior economist here. She just put out analysis. We're gonna lose 53% of our labor force to automation. But that is a scary thing. Innovation does run into normal human people with families, so for every time, who goes to the easy, who uses the easy pass here now to go through the tolls? Those are all people once, right? We forget. That's what people with a paycheck and a job and a family. The question is how do you transition our workforce into those? And that's the thing, that's why we have assemblymen here and Roberta here, what we have to grapple with. There's enormous opportunity. If there's a transition, we're, while we're losing 53% of our jobs to automation, we're actually growing net jobs over the course of that time. But there's one thing that Roberta mentioned. About 44% of our state right now has an educate, a post-secondary degree. We need 65 or 70% of those folks that have a post-secondary degree because that's where it's at with respect to these jobs. It's not your muscles anymore, it's your brain power. So unless we're doing this transition thing, I think the Chancellor mentioned it, unless we're harnessing that economic and education ecosystem now, we are going to lose jobs net out, and it is going to go to New Jersey, and I'm going to be very sad about it because there's going to be people down the street that are going to be upset that we didn't get our collective act together to train the people to get them into these jobs that are coming. The second thing is, and I think this is where the opportunity is, we're talking about a trillion dollars. Just think of the possibility which you can leverage with a little bit of the state investment. One dollar can turn into a million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars in investment, and that's a perfectly great thing to have in New York. If we don't do those things now, we're also going to lose out on the economic sector. And we are going to run into problems with our future economic growth and people living here. And it's going to create that downward spiral if we don't capture some of these things now. So I think there's plenty of opportunity, but there is the human condition. There is the human side that we have to focus on. And we aren't, I joked about the robots, we aren't Robots, there are a lot of living people behind it. It's easy for me to say, um, sitting in a think tank, which has a nice, comfortable job, 
don't worry, you're going to lose your job to automation, but there's plenty of opportunities for you. That's kind of like cold comfort for people, right? Well, thank you for that. But what about my job? So we have to do everything in our power to create those things. The thing I fear sometimes is, because I come from one of the sides of the political spectrum, is we then rush to, well, we have to stop it, we have to regulate it, we have to stop the train. Like trade, for instance, and I get a little out there on trade. Trade happens all the time. You can either put your head in the sand and say, you know what, forget it, we're not getting involved, and then bad things happen, or you learn how to harness it while protecting your work sector. That's exactly the same situation we're in now. So we have to balance this really difficult act, which is how do you take care of people in today's economy, in the future economy, how do we set up an education system to help with that? The chance to put up a slide to say we constantly have to do individualized education, that's the all logical stuff. But you know how hard it is to move the vast bureaucracy of a public higher education I system to that? <laughs> well, for, for some people, it's easier. <laughs> I think some people are beginning to regret it. It's like, what do I get myself into? But I think you have to take these big institutional players, including public policymakers, who do have electorates to listen to. And when the electorates are upset and saying, why are you taking my jobs? They don't care about all the scientific discovery. They're saying, I just had 15,000 voters at GM lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's a real outcome. And by the way, it's going to be Christmas in a month. Yeah. So how do you do all these pieces? I think Roberta has it absolutely right. And I think our scientists have it absolutely right. But we have to connect those two things together. Because on some level, there's a disconnect. What people hear is the peanuts. One, 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 one innovation, and you lose your job, but don't worry, we're gonna make it up on the back end, trust us. We have to develop this over time, exactly the way we're doing it now, having labor, having workforce development, having education sectors, and the innovation sector together working on these things. But I think it's an enormous opportunity, because if, there's, if we don't harness it, we're gonna lose. Someone's in the race to win it, someone's gonna win the AI race, do we want to win it, or do we want to lose it? And I can't have New Jersey lose it, because then I get all sorts of people in public policy mad at me, and we can't have that, so. Thank you. So, uh, again, to the theme of workforce development. Stephen A.J., this one's for you guys, okay? Is there a talent shortage in AI and relevant technologies? What, what kind of skills are you looking for, and what kind of people are you hiring, and where are they coming from? Um, so, uh, there definitely is a, a, a shortage of people skilled um, in these areas, uh, uh, basically in uh, big data analytics, in machine learning, in artificial intelligence. Um, we actually have done some reskilling of our, of our, you know, of our, of, of our staff um, um, to create that. Um, we are, and we are recruiting talent, um, you said where from? Globally. Um, um, we have, on my team, we have about 20, there's about 2,300 technical staff members that work at Xerox, you know, they're on my, on my team. Actually, about 900 of them are in the state. Um, um, uh, and we have other centers in, in California and Oregon and in, and in Canada, and then we do have um, uh, a team in, uh, in India. Um, we're recruiting in all of those places, and we recruit, we recruit the best from, from around the world. Um, uh, because that's, again, what, what you've got to do. And I think the opportunity for New York is, which it is today, and I expect it to be, is to, is to provide some of the best in, in, into the world. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna take the opportunity to, quite the question you asked, but also to kind of re respond to the, the comment about the lifelong learning. I think it's a really important point. And, and you're right, you know, employers have a piece of that. But one of the things that I think is different given the, the kinds of changes we're seeing in the pace of change, is um, it isn't only about teaching skills, but actually that people will have to invest in themselves and be able to learn over time. So graduating students, be they from high school, be they from the community college, um, or, you know, or, or baccalaureate degrees or above, with that expectation of, you need to continue to learn, right? It, 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 it is no longer true that, okay, I got my stamp of approval, you know, now I'm good. Yeah. And the other is equipping them to do that. So it's not only the unique, you know, because the particular technologies used in machine learning today, trust me, five years from now they'll be different. So it's 
how to learn, which means to me sometimes focusing more on the conceptual underpinnings, not only the specific technology. Say, so, example, some people say programming teach people programming, we teach them the C language. Well, if you're a good person in software, I'll learn C, Java, whatever you need, because I understand the concepts of how computers and algorithms. So we need to really focus, even at those, and this is, I think, a difference, even at that level of the high school graduate or the two-year degree graduate, some of those conceptual things, because they're going to have to also learn. And so I, I think that's a, it's a different mindset and a different way of thinking about what is it we're teaching them. Because I can tell you the specific skills I need over the next six years. I can't tell you what they are 20 years from now. I mean, what's the experience of IBM here? Yeah, so, you know, we, IBM, are one of those employers in New York State that uh, Chancellor Johnson mentioned. And we are, all, IBM and the company itself, undergoing a transformation. So we look at what our skills base was and what it is now and what it will be in the future. They are not, these three are not the same. So where we are now, we actually are taking our employee base and systematically giving them opportunities, both within what they do as work, as well as, as hours that we ask them to go spend while they're doing their job, additionally learning things that will prepare them for the future. For some individuals in some, uh, some careers inside IBM, that is still optional. For many individuals whose day job is actually changing, that is not optional, okay? So there's a minimum of 40 hours, for some it is 400 hours, you say, okay, within the year, you're actually gonna go and do all these things. You will learn things that you did not know before, and that is part of your job. Your manager and everybody is actually telling you to go do that, you know, and when you stuff your head with all that new things, you will actually get excited, you will want to do something else, and that's a good thing, right? And this is actually, as an employer, you can imagine, right? This is a huge amount of investment that we make in the person thinking that if you actually go do that, you're going to be more useful to us. But we're going to ask you to do that before we evaluate you to say whether you're good for that new thing or not, right? So that's an investment that we make, and we are actually seeing a lot of that happening successfully. That's with the existing workforce. So I think in terms of the skills that are needed to prepare us for the future, and this is because we are in SUNY, and you know, uh, it's very relevant for us to reflect on this, we have to prepare the future workforce with skills that make them very relevant for these careers in the future. I think one important point that came out from Roberta and Steve is these are individuals who will, you should not expect are doing the same thing for their entire career. So the first thing you have to prepare them for is you will be learning always, okay? And you will teach yourself always. You don't, shouldn't be waiting for somebody else to stuff your head with things. You should actually be stuffing your head with more things that are immediately useful. And then you are more useful to this changing world, right? And whether it is AI or some other change, you are actually much better prepared for it. So we participate in the PTEC program that the Chancellor listed as one of the educational activities. IBM is, is a big participant in PTEC. Not only do we participate in training some of those uh, students, we participate big time in giving them exposure to careers in IBM. We hire some of them, and in fact, I think is the first or second batch of PTEC graduates are actually in IBM now and they're flourishing, right? So to me, that's actually a, reaching all the way into the early stage of the educational career, preparing them in the right way, and then making them move. And they become role models, both internally and externally, for how we are gonna be preparing for the future, right? And this starts with PTEC as an example, but you know whether it's graduate school curriculum. So one pet peeve I have <coughs> is, you know back when I was in school, or people of my generation, we used to get schooled in something that was really, really deep. And you get evaluated on that, and you feel very good about the fact that I know so much about this little thing that I can now graduate. Right? And I mean, that's, graduate school is all about that. And I think we need to change that a little bit. Okay? We need to give breadth, useful breadth. And I don't know how to do that yet. Okay, but you just think of AI as an example, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is not one thing, actually. It's a way of thinking. So you have to teach that way of thinking and encourage them to actually explore that way of thinking in as many different places as possible. So it's not one course, it's not one thing in machine learning, 
It's how do you bring data and how do you bring insights, apply them in the right way, so that it actually changes what you're doing and actually becomes bigger and better. Right? This way of thinking, you have to actually make it a thing that you explore in every part of the curriculum. That's sort of the horizontal piece. And then the vertical piece is really going deep, like we did in graduate school. How do you actually solve a problem that you thought was unsolvable? You know, that, that, that's what we learn, in, at least as a science graduate, you know, that's what we learn. How do you go try and solve something that was unsolvable? And we saw an example that uh, the chancellor gave. You do that actually by using data. Okay, so early in, in, in our careers, we used to have the experience where gathering data was such a hard thing that the moment you got a little bit of it, you got so excited to publish the paper. <coughs> that has changed now. Okay, we have to really teach our students how to exploit all the data, not just gather a little bit and call it success, but actually exploit all of it. And that's a way of thinking again, in the depth, that in each curriculum, we have to actually go make that happen. Once we have that, I think the, the big data that, that Steve was talking on, this is big data in each discipline, right? And when we graduate people who are trained to think this way from the get-go, what they bring into the workforce, I think is gonna be a groundswell of innovation. People begin to think differently. It's not hitting the nail with the hammer you have, rather you're gonna go create more hammers of different kinds, because the whole world is data, the whole world is gonna look like nails to you, right? That's all the, the world I imagined. Which all we need is a bunch of new graduates who think this way, and we've changed the world, right? Okay, Mr. Um <laughs> Uh, that. <laughs> so, well, okay, we got it. Sorry about that. Um, we've heard about the challenges of the labor market from Jim and uh, the challenges faced by industry, but from Steve and RJ representing Xerox and IBM. What should New York and institutions like SUNY be doing from a workforce development perspective <coughs> to make sure we don't lose jobs in the state and that we train our people in the new skills and new types of roles, even in traditional industry? So. A lot of this, I loved what you both had to say. That was, and, and the idea of the breadth and the depth at the same time is so critical. I think we need to have stronger relationships with industry to feed us the information about what, what is going to be valuable, what is on your horizon, and, and then begin to think about how does that get interpreted into curriculum? How do we because we, we struggle with this all the time at the Department of Labor. Where's the data that we, that we can use to, to do some forecasting, which is hard to do, um, so that we're preparing people for the right jobs? And that is a very, very difficult thing to do anyway, let alone in a world that's going to be changing at that kind of pace. Um, and so the more partnerships that we can have across the spectrum, from every part of, of work, of industry, of creation, uh, so that we can begin, in New York State, we can begin to understand what, it, what is going to be necessary. The, the Amazon uh, headquarters for New York City, which I understand some people have issues with, but for me, uh, aside from the 25,000 jobs in 10 years, it is such an opportunity to partner at the very front of that, at the establishment of that headquarters, what do you need? And what do you think you're going to need in five years and in 10 years? And what kind of worker are you looking for? And it's right there in New York City. You don't have to imagine it. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to go across the ocean to see it. It's right there. And they are in our community. And they, we have total access to them. So every place that we have that kind of, of relationship, we should exploit it um, to its nth degree. because. You know, that kind of information is just incredible. And, and think, of, think of how empowering it will be to New York City kids to take them to the Amazon headquarters and walk them through and say, these are, these are people who are creating your future. Because these are not warehouse jobs. You know, these are, these are creative jobs. And I think the more that we do that, the much further along we'll be. The, um, the linkage of skill sets to work is so critical and it's not you're right it's not finite it's not i learned i learned to i learned to drill this way and then i will always have a job that's going to change so what we need to also encourage is the excitement of learning and the individual experience there was a study that was in the times i don't know a month or so i'm terrible at times so sometime in the past year um, and they talked about 
what happens for people who create things. And they said it could be something as simple as cleaning your house. It's, it's the creation, it's the physical, you, do, you bake a cookie, you clean your house, you paint a picture. That there is something that happens in people that is unique. And, uh, and they've done you know, brain scans and all kinds of stuff. That's the kind of connection that we want students to feel about their mastery of knowledge and their mastery of skill and their individualized pathway of learning. Because it's not, you're, nobody's working for the post office anymore. The post office is changing. So, you know, it's, it's the expectation that life will change and that is a good thing. And that is a very hard thing to get people to buy into because human beings are averse to change. It scares us. And so getting people, I used to teach improv, and getting people to just do things. Don't, don't judge it, don't stop, just say yes and. That's a hard thing to do. However, once you begin to do it, you'll never stop. And we need to find that, that tripwire that will help people embrace the learning and not be forced to it. And not everybody will, but we have to, we have to try. And I think the idea of individualized curriculum is critical. You don't have to study for the <coughs> test. You should learn the things that light you up. Very good. My last question. Last questions concern policy implications for how we're going to drive growth through AI. So, Jim, what should the state of New York be doing to fully recognize the growth opportunities of AI and not be left behind? What are the policy implications, and how do we address those? Two-part question. Um, I, I to tie it all together, I think first there is a generational difference. We have about 300,000 unfilled jobs in New York State right now. You think about it, that's kind of crazy, right? We can't meet current labor demand. Half of those are service sector jobs that people just don't want, mm -hmm. as much as we say we all want those jobs. Half is because we do have a skills gap existing in the state right now. Generationally, though, we do have the Uber generation, which does bounce around to multiple careers. I think that's sort of their mindset. That creates a different set of public policy problems, right? How do you pay for retirement? How do you pay for health care? They, they believe in portable benefits now, not employer-based benefits. So there's a whole public policy forum just on the mobile, yep. young, entrepreneurial spirit person now in the workplace. And how do you protect and how workers? Do you do it? And, how you, and while protecting workers at the same time, to have those things, right? The state, on many levels, Ajay mentioned a lot of things the state quietly has been developing, right? Part of education curriculum is by high school or college, it's too late. Quietly, the state has been changing the curriculum to get computer-based science education at the first grade, second grade. It's like, like it's a language issue. You want to speak Spanish? When do you learn Spanish? When we do it in the United States now in seventh or eighth grade, which is like the worst time to do it, right? Compressing kids are like the worst kids to teach. Or the first, second grade. So you almost have to build into our educational system that early part. p -tech, which is a version of early college high school, breaks down these traditional barriers. There's an elementary school, there's a middle school, there's a high school, there's a college. That goes away. There's no, the student doesn't care where they are. The state has quietly funded these programs. The President Obama came to one of the biggest p -techs in New York City, but the state's been putting in millions of dollars every year to foster the development and growth of these types of inst institutional changes within our education system, which are critically important, right? So that's one area. Roberta talked about how do we link businesses up with the educational sector. Everybody says it's just easy, we should talk to one another more. But no one likes to talk to one another, surprisingly enough. It's when you actually say talk to one another, they don't want to because people are busy. We did a law. Or they don't want to listen. Or they want to listen. Uh, I think the listening part's harder. But, yeah. but there's a perfect example of that. We have, a, we have the, the vice chancellor for community colleges here now. We have community college system, a robust community college system, probably one of the most expansive community college systems in the nation. We have enrollment decline. Well, we have a jobs need and a skills need all across our sector. We said, why don't you talk to our private sector? Give the Labor Department what they need, and we'll give you money. The state invested money into talking to one another just so you could build those linkages. We call it a job linkage program. We try to make it as obvious as possible. <laughs> job linkage program, community college, business. Thank you. Talk to one another. We'll give you some money for it. But those are things that I think the state has been doing. I think my biggest fear is that with, for policymakers um, is the knee-jerk reaction to what Roberta talked about. There is a fear in all of this. 
And if we're, li we're living in a time of divisiveness, but really it's anxiety. We don't want to talk about the, we can talk about the political science of the politics of our current national environment. But the current federal administration did capture an anxiety of the nation of a forgotten working class. Those are the folks that we need to capture. Those are the people not filling the jobs that we have right now. Those are the kinds of kids not going to school. Mm. By the way, you do a poll, national NBC poll, 50% of the nation don't think higher education is worth it. 50% of the nation. That 50% happen to be the people who absolutely don't have the college degree that need the college degree or some folks secondary education, who voted for the person in the office at the federal government right now. But they're capturing something there. But that's a crying, that's, that's, they're shouting out the policymakers. It's for you guys to demonstrate your value to us, that we're, you believe in what we do in our mission. So I think we have to take some of these things to scale now. Early college high schools, curriculum development, linking businesses, especially in a regional approach, because you're either gonna win or lose. And right now, we have some of the pieces in place, but I don't think we have it all knitted together in order to win the, the, win the big battle yeah. of the economic forefront, the innovation forefront. So I think that's some of the things that we have to do and take to scale. And be willing to take on some of the traditional, you said change, people are anxiety change. Why not do more curriculum development changes in school? Welcome to education in New York State. How hard is that? You run into teachers and you run into parents who are saying, well, well what's all of this? Change in my school is just right. I don't tell my school what to do. You run into community colleges saying, well, don't tell us what to do. You run into industry saying, well, we know better than they do. So you have to almost facilitate, what government can do is foster and facilitate that conversation to happen or everybody loses. So I think we're doing some of those things. It's how you do it on a scale now, which I think is the most important part. I think the biggest fear I have is five years from now, we don't do it, the jobs are going away, and we're actually not uh, replenishing our workforce in a robust manner to fill these jobs. We're going to have more unfilled jobs versus less unfilled jobs. Okay. At this point, I'd like to open up the floor to uh, questions from the audience. Um, any questions uh, for our panelists on the general topics of AI, business, labor, the economy? Yes. I if there's a microphone over in there. Thank you. I am a, I'm just standing over here so I can see well. I'm a political scientist, which means I study people, and those people respond to the kinds of innovations and interventions that we're talking about. So for everything that we do, for every um, innovation, for every technology, for every policy, people are going to respond to those. So the question is, how are we preparing both the um, innovations that we're doing and the workforce to deal with the people that we're expecting to have to interact with these innovations. So in healthcare, that would be patients. In social services, that would be the clients who are coming into an agency. This goes back. Um, England wanted to tax people, and they decided to do it based on the, side, on the number of windows in a house. So what did people in England do? They bricked up all their windows, right? So their taxes would be lower. And the same thing happens with EBT cards, and it happens with the algorithms, right? So if you are um, algorithm now in Pittsburgh, to predict who is more likely to abuse their children. And one of the predictive factors is have you used alcohol services? So that just disincentivizes people who need help from getting it. And so for every, you know, we talked about the, the pace of technological change, people are adapting just that fast to those things. So what are the kinds of, um, strategies that you're doing to help people interface with these technologies and help the workforce help people interface with these technologies. Sure. I, I came back from... First of all, just so, she's not just a political scientist for the record, she's the director of policy and research for the Institute, so she's a little bit of a ringer, so... <laughs> That's a real political science question. That's a real political science question, so I'll defer to my colleagues. <laughs> so, I'll answer that from the, the healthcare practice, you know, first from the from the patient point of view, which is actually quite, in my, in my opinion, actually is uh, uh, very easy for patients to see what that change is and for them to embrace it, right? Because they, they actually suffer from this inefficiency that I, that I was giving an example of. They know that the system is not doing as much for them as they, they, they want to have that system do for them. So take outcomes as an example, you know, healthcare outcomes. If uh, you have a condition and you know that the best outcome that is possible is of this kind. Every patient thinks that I'm that, I should be getting that best outcome. 
But the reality is the best is always not, is not the mean. So there is a difference between the mean and the best. It, it, for us as practitioners to actually educate the patient that if you participate, the mean actually gets closer to the best. You, while you are part of the mean, you actually are really experience something better than what you're experiencing today. That's, you know, we have to show the patients that that outcome is what is going to cause them to adopt whatever the transformation is that we are suggesting to them. I think a bigger barrier or perceived barrier is actually in the healthcare practitioners, not just the physician, but also, you know, care manager or whoever. You know, all of those individuals, they are accustomed to doing things in a certain way and they have been trained to do things right by their training. Now you're telling them that the data is actually going to tell them something additional and they have to use that in addition to make a decision that is different from what they were trained to make. So this is actually a shift that we have to have the practitioners achieve. And my uh, argument or, or thesis here would be the average practitioners will improve their practice. They will actually make better decisions will improve outcomes for their patients by using assistance of AI-based tools. Okay, so we're not replacing them actually. We're not saying, you Mr. Radiologist don't have a job anymore. Rather we are saying that radiologists spend this much amount of time sitting in a dark room, staring at that image, making that decision. How can we make them focus on the few images, like the example Chancellor was giving, the few images that actually require their attention. Majority of the images actually have no abnormality. Can we use an AI tool to actually screen for that and say, you know what, those things you can spend far less time on. But these things are borderline or these things are frankly abnormal, spend more time on. So what we have done with that is we made the practitioner actually improve their efficiency, focus on things that seem to be abnormal or borderline, and actually improve the outcome, right? So my answer is really, the adoption, yes, it is a change, adoption is difficult, but by giving better outcomes to the patient and giving better outcomes, better outcomes in the hands of practitioners who can practice AI better, we're actually causing them to adopt, right? So that will, that will be the, the logic that we have to use with them. So, um, uh, what, what, one of the things we've really been focused on um, for a long time, actually, at, at Xerox, which becomes even more important as technologies get more complex, is this idea of what's called user-centered design. So it actually starts, so rather than start with the technology, you actually start with who's going to use it and what is their problem. And we hire people, so this is really an interesting job opportunity yeah. for the future. I, I, I don't know, but I guarantee you some of those 300,000 jobs you can't fill are in this area of human-centered design. Yeah or what's called ethnography. And so we actually hire people at, at, at our research centers who come from a social sciences background, cognitive psychology, um, ethnographers like Margaret Mead who go out and study. Because we go out and say, how does a doctor make that diagnosis? How, what, and, and how, when, not only do they make diagnosis, but when they interact with the patient and, and, and order some care, what is it all that they're paying attention to? What will make it easier or harder for them? And then though, and we form teams of people with that kind of expertise, with the you know expertise in the algorithms. And so this idea of user-centered design, there's a there's a whole set of knowledge and skills there that I think is a really important uh, actually area and opportunity. And also for you know some people feel left out. You know, well it's all about the technology, and what if you know I don't want to be the algorithm. Well, great, don't be the algorithm person. Be the user-centered design person but learn how to work in a team to synthesize something. And you have to understand enough about the technology, you know, not to design it, but to have that interaction. And so focusing on that end user and really understanding that problem and thinking that through and, 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 and going right to the source are things you know, that we do to make, and, and, and you're dead right, the more complicated technology gets, the more important that is. I think one thing too is the the incredible need to democratize uh, the skill sets. So there is this idea, the 50% of people who say college is useless because they don't have it, they don't have access to it. There's a sense that I'm, for some people, I'm going to be left out of this because I'm not good at math 
I don't like science, I live in a poor region, you know, we, we all know the reasons. So we have, as a society and as a state, we have a real responsibility to democratize access. The great thing about digital technology is it is highly democratic. You know, it's for, in, in my former industry in entertainment, it reduced the cost of production so anybody could do it. You can shoot a movie on an iPhone. It completely opened up a, a whole world of creation to people who had been shut out before. So AI has the ability to do that, but we have a responsibility to, to um, make sure that that's open to everyone because otherwise you are definitely gonna end up with silos of people who are left out. And in, in a democracy, the people who get left out are the people who get angry. And you don't want to see what happens when that happens. Uh, and it's just not right. So, you know, we, it's, it's, you know that's the, it's, it's the Gandhi thing, you know, be the change you want to see. You know, you have to, in your own practices, make yourself open to the change and, and include everybody. It's why you have to have diversity. Because it is a stronger way to do change. When, when change is only done by a select few, you create real problems. A more diverse workforce is a more equitable workforce, is a stronger workforce, it's a stronger country. Uh, let me try one quick question. question. One quick question. Uh, we're running a little so Is there a question? Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'm Colin Garvey. I'm a uh, graduate student over at RPI, um, PhD student working on AI. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> from a social science perspective, and uh, we've heard a lot about jobs and the workforce, uh, but I wondered if you could talk about wages. So we've discussed 50% uh, of people who you know aren't interested in getting higher education, and um, I wonder if that has anything to do with wages on average staying flat over the last 40 years. Um, and how AI might affect that. Um, we're seeing half of the 300,000 jobs in our service positions, which are increasingly um, at risk from automation. So uh, within that kind of question of wages, uh, who's going to pay for lifelong learning is my question. Is that going to be a burden carried by workers? And will managers also need to uh, continue to learn? That is a great question. Managers <coughs> have to continue to learn. You cannot manage if you can't stay up with your workforce. Even more than yeah. the workforce. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the worst thing you can do is have somebody supervising people who are smarter than them or more informed than them. I spent um, a lot of time doing that here. So. <laughs> <laughs> wait, the reality is the wages, if you're looking at bigger innovation deals like Amazon, they're higher wage jobs, frankly. The problem is we don't have the skill set that put people in those higher wage jobs. There is a legitimate concern of pushing the bottom out and where are you pushing them to, right? So but how do you lift those people up into those jobs? That is a very difficult question. So the question you're hearing right now in many of these big transitional things is there are gentrification problems. There are issues of the haves and have nots. I think the question is how do you get them into a, people into a program of economic mobility? Everybody in social science reads the Chetty studies now. If you go to a, system, a, a, a school of public higher education, that's the greatest single thing you can do to have social and economic mobility. There's a lot of convincing and there's a lot of transition involved in that, but these are all high wage jobs. There's a reason why, like we said, we're not filling the low sector jobs. No one wants those jobs, they don't pay enough. It's how do you do all of those things while not pushing the bottom, further bottom, lifting them up at the same time is a very difficult public policy matter that people have to grapple with how to transition those folks at the same time. Okay. Um, this is very interesting. Unfortunately, uh, we're, we're out of time. Fortunately, we got another panel after this, but I'd like to thank our panelists, and um, we'll then move into the break. So thanks very much. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so welcome uh, to the second uh, panel of the afternoon. Uh, my name is David Dorman. I'm a, a faculty member at the University of Buffalo. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to do uh, is uh, first introduce our uh, esteemed uh, panelists here, uh, and then sort of distinguish uh, what we were doing different in this panel than uh, what we did uh, previously. So I'm joined today by a group of, uh, of, of five panelists who are uh, experts in a, in a wide range uh, variety of, uh, of areas. 
and bring really a broad base to, to this discussion on uh, ethics and society. So uh, as with the first panel, their uh, bios and titles, full titles, in, the, um, uh, in, in, in your uh, handouts that you have there. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, briefly introduce them. Uh, Dr. Selma uh, <coughs> Brinkshort um, from the uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Uh, Dr. Kevin Geis, uh, Director at uh, Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, Mr. Jonathan uh, Maines uh, at, from the University of Buffalo uh, School of Law. Uh, Dr. Teresa Pardot uh, from the uh, University at Albany. And the Honorable Clyde Vanel from uh, the New York Assemblyman from the 33rd District. So welcome. So um, before I get started, uh, what I'd like to do is set the stage a little bit for what we're going to be uh, talking about. Um, so we heard a lot uh, from the previous panel. Um, but I think that we can all agree that there's tremendous potential for AI, uh, both in, in, in jobs uh, and in growth and, and, and the impact that it could have uh, on the state of New York, uh, but also for tackling complex uh, social problems uh, that we have. But in order to do this, and in order to achieve this, I think that we really need to um, pay as much attention to these issues in, of the societal and ethical challenges as we do the technical ones. And it's great that we're starting to talk about this now at, at, at a fairly early point uh, before things become uh, real challenges. Uh, in particular, the issues of fairness and safety, uh, security and privacy really need to be addressed and we need to address them by providing constructive solutions that mitigate these risks before they get out of hand or they start to influence uh, things unnecessarily. Um, it's clear that academia and industry and government need to work together uh, for these holistic solutions uh, so that we don't stifle the opportunities that we talked about uh, in the previous panel and that the state of New York isn't left behind. We want to make sure that SUNY uh, will integrate AI and ethics and in all of its research and in the classroom. Uh, we want to make sure that SUNY will work with local governments and state governments to help shape policy, which is what we're here today to talk about. And we want to make sure that we largely engage the local communities, the people that are really affected by these influence of AI, uh, to make sure that AI works for everyone. So with that, uh, I'd like to start with the discussion. We'll do this basically the same way. I have some questions for the, for the panel, and uh, then we'll open it up at the end uh, for questions from uh, from the audience. So the big thing is really uh, realizing the potential. So um, the last panel talked about a lot of the economic growth and the key problems facing our society. Um, Assemblyman Vanel, uh, you are obviously a, an entrepreneur, uh, an attorney, uh, a community advocate, and you uh, sit on the chair of the Committee for New Technologies in the Assembly. So you have a broad perspective of, of, of what we uh, see as the, as the real challenges here. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment and give us your thoughts on what we need to do to ensure that the uh, state of New York benefits fully from AI, and in particular, uh, what challenge do you see in, in addressing these things? Well, first of all, uh, you know, thank you for having me, and I, I'd like to big, big kudos to uh, to this uh, the Rockefeller Institute and to SUNY for putting this uh, together. Now, um, so I uh, am the chair of the, uh, the subcommittee for uh, Internet New Technologies. And what's very interesting, uh, you know, when it comes to making policy and with my uh, other policymakers in this space is the information gap and the apprehension towards technology, the apprehension towards, uh, towards the progress of the future. Some of my members, don't use ATM machines. That's funny, but it's scary. It's scary to see how when we were talking, when we speak about, uh, we speak about the community and, and the general public's um, uh, uh, apprehension towards the progress of technology and how it's going to affect the workplace. How is it viewed? Is it viewed as, is that challenge viewed as uh, you know, something that is scary, or do we see the opportunity? And as someone that has the bully pulpit, someone that has the, you know, has the opportunity to speak about these things, how do we as policymakers address it? I'm from 
the greatest corner of the earth, Queens. <laughs> and in Queens, there was some great news that happened last week. One of the biggest companies in the world is coming to Queens. And they say that they can provide between, on the low end, 25,000 jobs, on the high end, 40,000. Imagine, and that's just the jobs, imagine the eco, the job ecosystem of what's going to go on down, down in, in, in Queens and in New York City and for the state. At the same time, many of my colleagues are pounding their fists on the desk saying, get it out of here. What's the disconnect? Watch out what comes out of our mouths, right? People, as, as the earlier other panelists said, a lot of people in the community, a lot of people in the, uh, out there are afraid that they won't be able to qualify for some of these jobs, or they're only thinking about the high-tech jobs. They, they don't understand, and we are not saying that there are going to be a myriad of, ty of the types of jobs that are come in, right? Someone has to, you know, they're from, from opening up the doors or cleaning the, 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 the building to programming to high-level management positions. But if we ourselves are looking, are looking at it as it being something adverse to us, then that's a problem. But, but the how. How do we figure out how to, pre pre to prepare New Yorkers for this new, uh, what's going to happen in the future? One of the things I was trying to do is get out of my comfort zone before I could go out and tell other people uh, to, do, to do the same. This year, I learned how many people know how to solve the Rubik's Cube? <laughs> this year, <laughs> this year, it took me a long time to figure it out. But I figured it out. And I could do it, it could take me about two minutes, maybe three, until I saw a 15 year old do it in like 10 seconds, right? <laughs> But I have a, in my office, I have a 3D printer where I printed out, uh, where we made a robot that solved the Rubik's Cube with artificial intelligence. I was able to print out the parts of this machine myself, right? Able to uh, have the uh, electronic parts to program how to do that. Now, this machine does it. It takes a little while, but the machine does it. Powerful stuff. If you can, if you can figure out how to have to work with the machines, work with the artificial intelligence, as we said before, that's very important. We have to think about this stuff differently. Another thing that's very important. I'm going to close here. Is part of the reason why we're here is that when we make policy, we cannot make policy alone in a silo. Right? We need. We, this is a very powerful institution. We need SUNY to help guide us. We need, we need the industry to help guide us on, on where we should go. These are big, the big questions of tomorrow. And, and policymakers cannot, I'm not smart enough to figure it out by myself. We need academia. We need, we need the private, uh, we need private uh, sector to help figure out how to implement these big major technologies and changes in the world moving forward. Great, thank you. So I'm not sure if we should uh, debate whether it's ethically uh, responsible to build a robot that's going to replace 10-year-old kids that solve Rubik's Cube or not. <laughs> but uh, for a lot of applications, that, that is a concern. Um, so um, uh, Selma, you've worked uh, with technology and, and philosophy and ethics in particular, how to build AI systems uh, that are ethically aware, uh, so to speak. And in particular, you know, how do we um, uh, take uh, systems that can uh, have can test for right and wrong and no right from wrong and, and can be held to the same types of ethical standards that humans are. Uh, would you mind commenting on uh, what your work has involved in that area and what your thoughts are on that problem? Sure, thank you. I did hear the how in your question, but first let me let me say the history of this is very interesting. Uh, I divide all of history from the standpoint of ethics into three phases. 
In the first phase, we were concerned with uh, what ought humans to do, pure and simple. The next phase, the humans start building machines that are pretty powerful, somewhat intelligent, and now we have to consider specifically what ought the human to do when building, designing, etc., this kind of technology. That in the old days, for me, when I first started in education, was called computer ethics. We've entered a third phase in which we must ponder the possibility that machines need their own ethical sensibility. And that's where we are, I think, and that is what you're alluding to specifically in terms of my, my work. As to why you would ever want to do this, I can encapsulate the rationale by saying uh, there's an acronym. I refer to it as the PAID problem. If you have a powerful machine that's also truly autonomous and really intelligent, that spells some serious challenges that can be summed up by the word danger. And that's why you need the machines to have internal controls. Um, now, as to how to do that, I don't know that you've given me sufficient time to cover the details, uh, but I would say one thing. You have to figure out, at least in the way my project is approaching this, to mathematize ethical principles and ethical theories, because ultimately there is no other language for a machine. No matter how intelligent it is these days, you don't walk up to Siri and start giving a disquisition on utilitarianism versus divine command ethical theories. So you have to figure out how to do that. And so far, we don't know how to do it, uh, but we're working on it. You also finally ask uh, about standards and right and wrong from the human case to the machine case. Well, I think it would be a good idea to have standards for machines that are higher than the ones in place for human beings, frankly. I, I, I don't think we want some of the outliers that we see in the human sphere to happen in the machine sphere. That would not be a good thing, especially given, as I said earlier, some of these machines might be extremely powerful and extremely intelligent. So I, I really want a justification from a machine as to, for example, why self-defense is ethically permissible uh, that might be more cogent <coughs> than what humans, uh, on average, can provide. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so Kevin, um, this has always been an issue uh, sort of within the, in the military, and I think one of the things that happens um, in, in government and in the military is that uh, humans monitor each other, so perhaps that's something that uh, we need AI systems to, to monitor other AI systems, so there are uh, options for doing this. But can you call, um, just comment on, uh, in your world, sort of what your thoughts are on, on ideas for uh, effectiveness um, and, and making these types of ethical uh, decisions when you talk about the types of things that the military does today and perhaps you know how uh, this can be translated into uh, machine human partnerships that uh, would transcend uh, some of the um, you know fear that we might have about ethical behavior of machines. Sure, uh, a couple comments on pretext. So first of all, I can't get in between the New York, New Jersey conflict. The <laughs> uh, is here for the entire nation, so we can't, uh, can't help you there. Um, but just, just some perspective from history. So back in the early 1900s, as the Wright brothers were working on achieving the first human-controlled powered flight, um, Wilbur would go around and he would talk to various groups, whether it was garden clubs or even I think there was a beekeeping club he went to talk to, but you know, in rooms much like this and, and talk about the challenges that they were having. And one thing that he continually emphasized with that group was that the, the key issue that they had was not the engineering of the contraption. It was having the knowledge and skill to operate the machine. So I say that in the context of the organizations I come from, it's the Airman Systems Directorate, the Air Force Research Lab, and our whole focus is what is the role of the human within the technology that, that we're developing. And that technology spans a whole gamut and covers things that have been talked about today. We have healthcare professionals in the military, we have lawyers, we have contracting uh, specialists, and the ability of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning to help us to kind of you know, uh, rising tide raises all boats. Do things better across our enterprise uh, is, is important. 
So there are three quick things that I want to talk about. The first one is, is philosophy. We talk about autonomy, and, and fundamentally autonomy is not independence. And I want to delineate that in that even in a military context, the, the autonomy that a, an individual has is still tied back to somebody that's commanding and a commander and making decisions. And any system that we're developing, and even as we develop things that are even better at thinking uh, to work alongside these, these airmen, there will, there's, there's command and control. And to your point, we have to ensure we have robust measures by which we can ensure that they're performing within the constructs, the construct that they, that they should. Uh, the, the second uh, area I want to talk about is workforce. Uh, the importance of ensuring that we're developing the next generation of folks that can help us to develop those systems that will operate within the constraints that we're looking for. So it's not just the business that's represented here, you know, substantial and successful business. You know, we need talent within the, within the government to ensure that we have those leading thinkers, not just on the development of the technology, but also folks that have experience in the, the ethics and social uh, aspects of employing that technology, because that's been a part of uh, our legacy and how we operate in the, uh, in the DOD. And one of those areas that we're, that we're, uh, that we're looking at, and we talked to the Chancellor about this today, was how can we bring artificial intelligence to bear such that we can ensure that people are selected and trained appropriately for the positions that we have? How can we accelerate the learning of individuals utilizing perhaps a personal assistant that is with you throughout your career that understands what you learn and how you learn and how you can learn best to make you the most proficient and effective individual within the, uh, the workspace that we have? And then the third thing that I wanted to reference is some applications that we've, we've already been looking at. Uh, one of them is how can we use artificial intelligence to help us to do better with talent management, to ensure that we get the right person in the right job. You know, there's a lot of focus on sort of the pointy end, end of the spear in a, in a military context, but you need the best contract officers, the best finance folks, the best admin folks doing their job across the enterprise such that the bureaucracy is not burdened because you didn't pay attention in how to best align folks. And I think, you know, artificial intelligence and the ability to delve into the large uh, data that we have uh, on individual applicants and how we can best align folks. And then the second one is automation that's already been employed in some of our fighter aircraft. It's called auto ground collision avoidance. And this prevents, uh, at this point in F-16, but prevents an aircraft from crashing into the ground just because of the pilot lost situation awareness. Now we talk about acceptance of technology and, and at the beginning of this technology, it's actually been around for a decade or more, there was a lot of resistance from the, the pilot community because that human wanted to be in charge all the time. And, and being able to develop a system that um, the, at, for a period of time, very short period of time, that pilot has no control. And the way the system is developed though, it takes over after the pilot has had the last chance. Right? So the, by the time the automation kicks in, it can respond quick enough that you've already lost your chance. And after we've had seven aircraft and seven airmen survive and go back to their families, there's a much greater acceptance of this technology that's there to save your life. When it detects that you're getting ready to fly on the ground, it just pulls the wing level and does a 5G pull and gets you out of the way and then turns the, the controls back over to you. So it's, it's, it's those things, and that's automation, it's not the artificial intelligence, but this, this, this relationship between the humans and machines, what's the role of the human, and how does the human get the most out of what the machine can offer is, is central to what we're looking at in my career. Okay. I just want to add one, uh, one thing here. Um, uh, we're going to get to a little bit on education and, and AI uh, later on, but just to tie those last two uh, sets of comments together, do any of the panelists have any um, um, suggestions on uh, how we can start to build these types of um, AI um, things into our education of whether our, our, our students or continuing education so that um, they can monitor and understand systems for ethical behavior and understand how um, you know things are that might be getting out of hand uh, because we are going to have to have humans that are going to be monitoring these systems, working side by side with these systems. And um, if they treat them completely as black box, they either trust them or they don't, rather than monitoring them. So I was just wondering if any of our panelists had any comments on, on that aspect. 
Um, yeah, that's a, I think it's a really great question. The, um, I think one of our challenges um, uh, in, in education is, is trying to understand um, what are those kind of event points where um, that kind of knowledge is really relevant to the decision making at hand. So if we think about you know, automated decision making and sentencing and identification of youth at risk, we think about different kinds of professionals that we've talked a lot about here today. We think about criminal justice professionals, lawyers, judges. Uh, we think about counselors, social workers, who are going to have to understand at some point that the tools that they're using to support their decision making may be flawed, uh, or they may be perfect, but they need to understand the foundations uh, of those tools. And so figuring out, in some cases, how do we, A, sort of bring ethics, computer ethics, quote unquote, sort of put forward into the, into the modern age with the students who are doing the algorithm development or managing the data, but then also um, bringing an appropriate level of exposure to these ideas, to the people who are going to be a sort of, I think the question that Patty Strzok asked, interfacing um, with these kinds of systems. Not citizens, necessarily, but professionals who are using these tools for decision making. So as we think about this kind of cross-university uh, kind of collaborations that are going to be necessary to, to develop these courses and, and put them into these curricula, uh, going back also to, to, to Jim's point, which is it's very, very difficult uh, to change the number of credits that are required, and is it an elective, is it a requirement? So how do we make these, uh, how we get this material into the curriculum in ways that, we, uh, that is appropriate for the different kinds of professionals and the role that they play um, if you will, in kind of the ecosystem of AI, I think it's going to be a real challenge for all of us. Um, I think there's some good answers, but uh, of course I didn't share any of them with you. <laughs> well, I'll give you a chance to do that later. Yeah, I'll do that later. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I, could, I could weigh in on that a little bit too. So, um, at University of Buffalo, where I teach, uh, we've created a, an ethical AI working group, which includes three people from it's three faculty from computer science, one from systems engineering. I'm from law school. We have a faculty member from media study and architecture, and we're thinking about ways to incorporate thinking about ethics and policy implications of these tools into, in particular, the computer science and data science curriculum, um, uh, which is training the technologists of tomorrow, and. Uh, and we're thinking hard about how to make this sort of interdisciplinary. So one thing, one, one idea that we're thinking about is to is to have um, students who are working either on a capstone project or on some practical project to sit down with lawyers who are studying the future lawyers, I should say, who are studying the, the legal constraints within which um, uh, technologists have to operate, um, and sort of talking to each other, identifying issue spotting. Like oh, you're scraping data, is that going to raise a problem under the Computer Fund Abuse Act? Uh, you know, you're collecting information from users. Have you thought through the privacy implications of that? Um, and, and getting students together to sort of work across disciplines and across professions, um, which is something we expect them to be doing uh, in, in the future in their careers. So uh, we're, we're trying to think about ways to integrate all the resources we have at the university, uh, at UB and beyond, uh, in order to train data scientists, lawyers, and others uh, to, to be sensitive to issues. Okay, so uh, Jonathan, let me uh, let me stick with you. So you, um, when we met, uh, when I first got to UB and uh, talked for an hour or so in your office, uh, I was really um, intrigued about your your passion for uh, the civil liberties and the transparency piece within government, and um, hadn't thought about really uh, that's a fundamental difference between uh, this transparency when humans are making these decisions and when AI systems are really making these uh, decisions. Um, so we've all heard about um, issues of fairness and bias that have come up in, in some of the AI uh, software for, uh, for policing, for sentencing guidelines, things that you would think that humans um, should have and, and, and ideally do have their, their finger on. Uh, but I was wondering if you could uh, just elaborate on, on what you think are the, the, the main issues and how would you address sort of uh, creating these um, these uh, systems that uh, can address these types of, uh, of ethical and, uh, and transparency issues where we have black boxes and the companies that are developing these aren't going to give us the algorithms and we're not going to ever know all of the data, uh, but still we need to keep an eye on it to make sure that it's, uh, there's not something unexpected. Thanks. Um, great question. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to talk about that, but just to sort of set, set the stage a little bit. You know, I guess my research and what I, what I think most about has to do with 
uh, the use of AI technologies in contexts where it's assisting humans to make decisions that affect people's rights and opportunities. So, as Teresa already mentioned, um, you know, judges now are using uh, risk scoring tools that are developed using machine learning uh, algorithms uh, to uh, inform whether somebody's going to be let out on bail or going to be kept in prison uh, awaiting trial, or jail rather awaiting trial. Um, similar tools are being used at sentencing to determine how long a person will be um, sentenced uh, for. Uh, in the child welfare context, there are now screening tools, again uh, developed using AI methods, um, that are meant to predict whether a child is at risk of uh, significant violence, um, the likelihood of significant violence, and to make appropriate um, decisions about how to handle that case. Um, in the employment context, we're screening resumes using AI tools. Um, uh, our healthcare decisions are increasingly informed by AI. So, um, and this, this all creates enormous opportunities, as, we, as we've heard. You know, the, the, the vision here is that we might be able to have more objective, unbiased um, systems. We can, we can sort of eliminate the human frailties from these systems. That's the vision. Uh, increasingly, though, I think we, researchers in this field, have realized that um, these systems can encode or incorporate the biases that already exist in the data that is fed into the, especially machine learning algorithms. So, for example, if you think about a system that's predicting where crime is going to occur, and one of the major inputs is where arrests have taken place in the past. Well, if the police are focusing on a particular neighborhood or a particular marginalized community, they're going to be overrepresented in the data, and the algorithm is going to suggest that the police go to those places, even if, in fact, crime is occurring um, just as often elsewhere in a city, for example. So we have to be aware of these risks that we're encoding bias, we might be laundering biases through, uh, through algorithms, um, sometimes maybe even exacerbating them. Uh, and uh, uh, I think increasingly we're, we're sort of thinking about how to, how to deal with those issues. And I think one, one important uh, potential solution. I think there's, met, there's actually, this is, this is no, there's no silver bullet to this problem. It will require um, a, a combination of private sector thinking about this, government, uh, researchers. Um, but one important piece of this, I think, is transparency, as you mentioned. So um, if we don't know how these systems work, um, uh, that they're even being used in some instances, uh, if we don't have a sense for how the data was collected or um, what, it was, what, the, what the system was optimized for, it's very difficult to um, identify whether there's likely to be bias in the system. Um, in, some, in some cases, uh, it, it's not going to be enough just to look at how the, the, the system was created, the AI tool was created. You'll have to actually go out and look at the outcomes. So are the outcomes having a discriminatory effect, even if it was made with the most benign intentions? Um, and, uh, and in this context, I think transparency is sort of, is sort of key. One interesting suggestion that's been floated in, the, in policy circles is the idea of an algorithmic impact assessment. So that when we're deploying an algorithm in a context that will uh, affect people's rights and opportunities in a significant way, um, there should be some obligation on, on the entity that's using the algorithm to disclose that they're using it, to discuss the purpose, to discuss the sort of values that went into designing it, um, the testing that, that was done to validate the algorithm, so that um, the public has some confidence that it's been vetted, and so that there's actually some incentive on the part of the people who are using the algorithm, the entities, the government institutions, and private companies, to uh, think about these questions before they deploy the algorithm. Um, and that seems like an interesting uh, regulatory intervention, sort of a light touch regulatory intervention uh, that might be useful in this context. Um, we're also thinking about the way that we as a, as a university, as a research institution, can be helpful in this space, and it strikes us that we're sort of uniquely positioned as kind of a trusted third party. You know, we're not a square, we're interested in truth and justice, not, not on particular sides, right? So, um, so, so that's part of the reason why we convened this ethical AI working group, was to have the scientists talking to people who are thinking about policy um, so, that, uh, so that they could think about how to develop these AI tools in ways that are sensitive to the, the policy and ethical concerns. And likewise, so that people like me are not floating solutions that are just flatly inconsistent with the way that these systems work, right? So we understand the technical aspects. Um, it's also, I think we can also play a valuable role in doing empirical research on how these systems are operating. Um, so uh, how, how humans are interacting with, uh, with AI systems, for example, is a fruitful area of research I think we're well positioned to, um, to undertake. 
um, even to have access to data that might otherwise be protected by trade secrecy concerns or other proprietary information, universities might be a place where we can have access to subject to sort of confidentiality restrictions to do the research that's necessary and sort of assist industry and government um, in that way. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about if I discuss that more. Could, could you invite me to your, to your sessions? Maybe? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think when you have an algorithm yeah. and then you assess it using some of the techniques that you're, you're pioneering, uh, that's the pleasant situation. We have to realize that if you've got an explicit algorithm, that's great. But if you've got a black box system that's computing a function through standard statistical ML today, it is, it's redundant, it is a black box. So you don't have an algorithm. That's tough. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in some of these instances, for example, um, these criminal justice outcomes, you can't really assess how it's working unless you go out and do very hard research of collecting data. So people that were um, collecting data about the outcomes uh, uh, in the world about recidivism or about people who didn't come back and appear in court. And that's not information that the, the court will have necessarily. It's not information that um, the designer of the algorithm certainly will have. So some of this work is actually very research intensive and difficult. Um, the, there are a group of journalists at ProPublica did probably the most famous study in this field about a, a compass, the compass tool, which is a, one of these risk scoring tools. And it took them, I think, a year and a half and a huge pile of money and I think four or five people um, to uh, go through 10,000 cases and get a statistically valid sample and to understand how the system was working. And they found that there, there were um, biases in how the scores were assessed with respect to race. Um, so, uh, that we wouldn't know that unless these journalists had been able to do that. Um, I think researchers at universities could do that kind of work too. Okay, anybody else from the panel uh, have any comments on this issue? Okay, so we've talked a little bit about ethics and about fairness and transparency. Another big issue is, is security and, and privacy. So uh, Teresa, you're an expert in uh, technology and, and, and policy. Um, and have a very broad perspective from both a uh, national and international level. We've heard from uh, a number of people today that there's a, a wide variety of, of views of, of um, how people deal with security, privacy uh, in different parts of the world. Um, the truth is that AI applications run on data now. Um, that, uh, with that, though, comes issues of, of security, privacy. We've heard about uh, you know just the data breaches that we've had in the last uh, uh, few years. Um, people don't want to give up their, their private data, especially when you start talking about medical data or, or history of, of, of your entire life. Um, can you just uh, address some of the uh, security and privacy issues of, of technology and from a technology and privacy uh, perspective, just so that we can get a better idea of you know, how we can address these issues with big data? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, so, uh, like Jonathan, I just want to give a little bit of a, a, of, a, of a kind of a statement in terms of my frame of reference. So, I, uh, as, as David said, I'm part of an organization that um, looks at the intersection of policy management and technology. And so, our interest is trying to understand the technology innovations that are occurring and what are the policy and management um, context within which those technologies um, can. Um, can thrive, can deliver the potential that we re believe they will. And so as we think about AI, I kind of, you know, I, I, I tend to do this a lot when I talk, right? So there's this interaction space where we think about um, AI, and, and in this case, I'm going to talk specifically about, about data, right? As we think about um, the data uh, as, as the fuel or the engine of AI. Um, and in my work over the years, um, I've thought about um, the data lifecycle, so the collection, the management, and use of data, and how do we think about um, the challenges associated with the collection, management, and use, and consider the issues of security, consider the issues of privacy, and understand how to create the capability within governments uh, so that the data that is necessary uh, to drive all of the models, all of the, uh, all of the tools, um, that will create potentially the value um, for citizens um, are, are effective. And so um, in, in my, um, my thinking, I wanted to maybe just tell a couple of quick stories. 
Right. So a few years ago, um, I was working with a group of people uh, from a number of different institutions, and um, we they were working on a book, uh, Privacy, Big Data, and, um, uh, and Security. And I was asked to come to the New York Academy of Sciences uh, to make a presentation, uh, a keynote talk, during the launch of this book. And I thought, oh heavens, how am I going to, uh, you know, these are data scientists and economists and social, uh, excuse me, uh, st statisticians, and while I have some background in computer science, I'm primarily social science, thinking about public administration issues and technology innovation in that context. And they said, no, 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 Teresa, what we need you to talk to us about is why can't we get the data we need to drive our analytics? What's going on? What, how do we understand the challenges associated with our efforts, um, or that are challenging our efforts to get the data that we need um, to do the kind of big data analytics that we know are necessary um, to deliver value uh, in the way that we all had imagined um, possible. And so I talked to them uh, about um, our experiences, and, and I think I you know, bring those um, things here today, which is that there is an entirely new uh, level of, of insight that's being generated around um, the lack of capability in our public organizations and private organizations, although I don't know that as, as intimately, around the issues of data management. And while we think data management, oh yes, you know, yes we need some of that as well, right? <laughs> um, what we know is that fundamentally, uh, the kind of opportunity that data is going to present um, to us in terms of driving, um, uh, driving AI will rely on our ability um, to pull together um, data that um, is well managed, is, is well governed. So, um, I talked with them about the critical role of data um, governance in terms of the issues of privacy, in terms of the issues of security, and having to convene the kind of experts who understand a particular data set, or if you will, all of the data sets that are available in a particular organization, and understanding the implications from a security and a privacy perspective of this type of data, the types of data sets, the reference series, what do we know about our data, that has to be managed, um, and, and what do we know about our data that tells us maybe we need a little less uh, investment in security and privacy on this particular data set, but heavens, we need an awful lot over here. And so what we've learned over the years is that there is a, rel there is a relatively low level of deep under of understanding of data that is available across um, government agencies, and we think about the potential to bring that data together to drive learning um, the more those things are happening, the more there is a revealing, um, uh, uh, real, real revealing that the data just is not fit for that kind of use. So I talked to them about the emergence of a new uh, executive level uh, um, individual in most uh, organizations, um, the chief data officer. Uh, the chief data officer, uh, is, we have one now for about two years in New York State, uh, and that chief data officer is thinking for the very, very first time about the creation of an enterprise-wide data strategy. And so creation of an enterprise-wide data strategy includes a set of priorities. And oddly enough, one of the priorities is creating data literacy in the New York State public sector workforce. Data literacy, right? We're not talking about, a, you know, we're not talking about um, you know, C or AI programming skills. We're talking about data literacy. What's a data element? What's a data set? What are acceptable ways to use this data? What are the potential security and privacy issues? Right? So we have to think about these kind of questions. And we have to think about questions such as, what data do we actually have uh, as an organization? What data do we need to think about in terms of this privacy and security uh, issues? And what kind of technological solutions are possible? And what public policy solutions are necessary for particular kinds of data sets? So we worked also, also with this group um, and talked about their frustration due to the lack of policy frameworks that would allow them to present uh, a policy to a particular public agency that said, yes, of course, you may have the data. And because often those statements don't exist, the default position is no, you may not have the data. Or yes, you may have the data, but you need to apply for the data. So a few years ago, here at Rockefeller Institute of Government, CTG, together with some other colleagues, brought together health policy research from across SUNY. So at Buffalo, Stony Brook, Binghamton, lots of other places, Albany, of course. 
And then we invited a, a, a set of colleagues who, uh, from the New York State Department of Health who have tons of data and lots of questions. And it was sort of like, you know, it's new data. <laughs> because these individuals had not been able to come together um, easily uh, to explore their common interests, they had not also been able to create the kind of data sharing capability that was necessary. They had not, they each, uh, uh, in their own effort, bore the burden of addressing the privacy and security issues. And the consequence in those cases, in many cases, was that if they had a one-year grant to answer a very specific public health question, it took nine months to get the data, they had one month to do the analysis, and one month to write the report. That is not what the expectation is. And so thinking about how to create these policy frameworks that address on an enterprise level security issues, privacy issues, and that come up with whether the solutions are technological uh, or policy, uh, depending on a particular data set and a particular potential kind of use. So I just want to tell one last story because I think that you know sometimes people say, oh sure, we'll just you know put together a governance body, we'll figure it all out, right? It doesn't doesn't work that easily. Somebody here earlier talked about um, the the range of skills. Right? So we need the kind of skills in our experts and our and our government officials that allow for the creation of consensus uh, around these very technical kinds of questions. And so how to create that kind of collaboration and coordination capability. I'll share one of my favorite quotes ever from all, one of the research studies we did on interorganizational information sharing or uh, state level response to the West Nile virus. And one of the um, uh, key scientists said, uh, collaboration is something I do when I'm backed into a corner. Uh, because it's really hard. It's very hard to create data sharing capability because we have limited frameworks with respect to privacy and security. So let me tell you one last story. Okay, so we often in the public sector look to the private sector for best practice models. Uh, one of those in particular is the financial services industry. A recent MIT Sloan Review article highlights the point that I like to make and then I'll end with this. Uh, a 2018 survey of, one, of Fortune 1000 executives report that 97% of them are investing uh, in, bu or in building or launching big data and AI initiatives. Another point that the article makes is that 77% of the respondents were from the financial services industry. Now, my work, this is really important. I don't just look at the first element, I, and I imagine you as well. I want to know what made that possible. So in this case, what we know from our work is that the financial services industry has been investing in data governance and data management at an unbelievable level, over and above any other industry, maybe except for the, the three letters in, uh, agencies in Washington. I know they do a pretty good job as well um, in data governance. So the financial services industry can do what they do with the data they have because they've invested in the infrastructure that's necessary to make sure that the data has appropriate protections, is secure, uh, privacy is protected as it needs to be. Uh, and so they'll be able to succeed. And I think in, in the public sector, we need the New York State data strategy, which will be, when it becomes, um, uh, when it gets finalized, will be the first enterprise-wide data strategy of any of the 50 states. So this is a problem, right? I, I like being in front of New Jersey, but it's, we shouldn't be in front of everybody. <laughs> but we are, if we get it done. Yes, it's great, it's great. And I would love to see more data being managed more carefully. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. So you might have actually answered uh, Assemblyman uh, Vandal's uh, sort of next question, and, and that's sort of, how do we bring all of this together? <laughs> you know, we, have you, we have you captive here for another 15 minutes, plus, plus the reception, I guess. Um, but, you know, if, you, if you're talking to now the, the heads of, of institutions, what are the roles uh, that the higher education uh, community here in New York needs to do uh, to address this? And what, you know, what, what do you think their role should be? in addressing some of these ethical and security and fairness issues? No, we have, you know, we have major, major uh, things that we have to uh, address as a, as a governmental body and, uh, as, you know, for our society. And, um, and it, 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 it's nonsensical if SUNY, if the education, if the, if the academia isn't part of this process, this, this pro of thinking this, this stuff through. One thing that's very interesting is that it's difficult to get a law passed. It's difficult to get these big things through. 
But once you get them through, do you know how hard it is to undo that law? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's, 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 it's very dangerous to understand that our policies have repercussions, right? They, it has ripple effects. And we're in a very important state. People watch what we do. Not only do other states watch what we do, the, the world watches. So it's very important for us to try to get this right. And I found out, I found that, and as everyone is saying, that with consensus, if we work together, we can get to better solutions. We're not gonna get to the perfect solution, but we can get to better solutions. One of the things that, uh, one of the bills that we've been trying to, to, to push and it passed is a bill, uh, uh, A8821, which is to create uh, uh, an artificial intelligence task force with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, industry, with, uh, with, with uh, academia, with policymakers to try to figure out what, where are we going to go in five, ten, and ten years, and in a, gen a generation from now, and not uh, have us. Because what happens too is if we don't properly work, if we don't properly put together a framework on how to think this through, we come out with reactionary kinds of policy, right? We see something bad on the news and we try to react, and that's the wrong way to go. Um, so we are, you know, just this, this conference is a, is a, is a blessing. Uh, it's great that, that we're doing this. Also, what's very important too is we have to also try to figure out how do we um, message this to the average person, right? How do we, how do we make people understand and, and demystify AI, demystify artificial intelligence, demystify where this stuff is going because, because it's, it's very important for people with the knowledge to be able to uh, to message it so that people understand the opportunities that are out there, right? Technology creates opportunities for just beyond, for opportunities beyond just being able to get a job, right? The opportunities to be able to become an entrepreneur. Right now, you just need a phone and a couch to be able to make money, right? Or a phone and a car to be able to make money in the share economy. That's a powerful thing. I came out for the first, I came out with a product that I'm selling on the internet that I created, I made, I protected it. I'm an intellectual property attorney, so I protected it. We can't copy it, blah, blah, blah. But, but what's which, which, so a blessing is that you're able to be able to make passive income now with the, with the technology that's available. That is something that was never, ever able to be done in the past with very little investment, and how do we take advantage of that? Right, great. Um, so we have uh, a few minutes left. Uh, I do want to open this up to, uh, to questions uh, from the audience. You have a great uh, group of academics here. You have uh, um, a uh, political uh, figure, and you have a military uh, figure. Uh, you're not always going to get this, so please, uh, uh, if we have any questions, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please do introduce yourself as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Craig Vaughan. I work for DeFacto Global. I'm a data scientist there. And I just have a question about the ethics and uh, data privacy issues. Um, how strong do you think the government should should be in dictating policy towards private business? Seems like more a question. Well, <laughs> one of the things that's interesting is that um, uh, uh, in, in, on May 25th, 2018, I believe, uh, uh, the European Union came out with the GDPR, right? With how to deal with with data um, uh, for Europeans. It doesn't matter if you're a European company or what have you. If any country, company around the world, um, uh, and they say um, um, uses, compiles, your, anybody in the EU's data, they have to have certain kinds of guidelines. <laughs> Right, so we're looking at that in New York State. We don't have a similar law like that uh, in, in, the, in the United States on, on, in this country on how to deal with data. We have separate agencies that have certain kinds of uh, uh, things like that, and we don't have anything like that in New York. First of all, we have to see that, is that the proper touch? Is that too strong of a touch in, in, uh, in Europe? Uh, and should we find proper balance in, in New York? I'm in a state where, in 2016, 
uh, in one of my counties, one of my board of elections lost 120,000 voter records. Purged. Boom. How does that happen with, with the state's data? We are, the, we are the custodians of your most vital information, right? So we have to make sure that we are utilizing the, the best, latest, strongest technologies to be able to, to make sure that this information is ironclad. You trust us with this stuff. So we have to think about the ethics part of it, and also we have to use the best forms of, of, of data protection, encryption, blockchain technology, whatever it is, to make sure that, that uh, people information is safe. We're also in a country where, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Equifax, oh my gosh, how does that happen? Right? Half of this country's data was misappropriated and we, didn't, we, didn't, we don't have the regulations to say what happens after some, such a misappropriation happens. We didn't find out until two months after and we're still caught and baffled. So, so one of the things that we're dealing with, and, you know, and it's important that I'm here and I'm happy to be here with everyone, is that we have to figure out what we're going to do in New York State and in the country with respect to how we treat our data, how we protect our data, what, what processes we use, and what is, the, what is the, the regulatory regime and framework to be able to make sure that um, uh, inst you know, our institutions and our companies that operate in New York with New Yorkers uh, information is, is properly secure. I was going to add that your question presupposes that uh, government would know what to do. <laughs> so generally the drift was how draconian you know, is it going to be? If you watch the Facebook uh, situation, yeah. the upshot of that was uh, A and B. A, Facebook assumes AI is going to patrol and solve the problem, and B, the politicians were making basically the same assumption. Unfortunately, C, we don't know how to do that yet in AI. So there are huge job opportunities there on that side of social media. But I would just make this conceptual point about your question. I'm not sure we know what to do. Do you think it should be statewide or nationwide? Well, I, I'm a state lawmaker, right? I'm not a congressperson. You know, I, but in all honesty, I think it, it, should, be, it, should, be, it should be national. But for example, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of bills on my committee that address how we're dealing with cryptocurrency and how we're dealing with blockchain technology when the federal government is not moving in that space. So we have to you know limit it to how it affects New York. Um, but when it comes to data, we have to uh, if we if we can we have to try to, to lead with this with respect to at least how the data is being used uh, in, in in New York State. Yeah, please. So um, uh, about maybe eight years ago, five, eight years ago, um, the Center for Technology and Government was doing a project with uh, um, New York State's um, Bureau of Shelter Services that manages um, all homeless shelters across uh, the state of New York. And we were creating for them um, an analytical system to help them understand the impact that the services that they were providing were having on the homeless population. And naturally, the homeless shelter directors were concerned that this new resource would um, uh, violate the privacy policies of the agency. Um, and because there was a privacy policy, we were able to show uh, that what we were doing did not violate the, the policy. However, in the process of doing so, um, we discovered, and they as a community discovered, that the policy didn't really cover all of the issues that they were concerned about. In fact, the domestic violence shelter directors have a very different uh, uh, concern than um, what we call your normal shelter, your family shelters, right? And so in a domestic violence shelter, their, their concern is not whether the public or uh, whether the public knows who is in that shelter. Their concern is that the public not know where that shelter is. Right? So it's the victim versus the, you know, the, 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 the perpetrator. And so they began to understand in, uh, inside of that particular agency, inside of that particular policy, um, policy um, program, that they had different perspectives on, how, on privacy. And so when I hear things about should it be a national or should it be a state, um, I think at one level there might be national or state level policy. But once we get down to specific kinds of data, uh, we need to understand if those particular data sets require higher level or different kinds of privacy and security frameworks, and, and you know, that's a 
reiterate, right, but to repeat myself, um, that's where data governance comes in. Well, we're getting to the end of our uh, time here, so uh, please let me uh, uh, join me in thanking our uh, panelists here. <laughs> so to uh, provide some closing re remarks, um, uh, let me introduce uh, Grace Wang, the Senior Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development uh, for the SUNY Systems, who will uh, finish up our uh, uh, panelists today. Well, thank you, David. Well, thank you. It's, I hope you all enjoyed today's uh, discussion. And would you please join me to thank Chancellor Johnson and also all of our panelists and uh, moderators. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> and so through today's discussion, I think it's very clear that we are at the beginning of the AI-driven economy. And it's very exciting, it's full of potential, and at the same time, it's very clear that we just cannot afford not to take any actions. And not to take any actions itself could be very expensive. I know some of you probably know this story. Back in 1980s, AT&T commissioned McKinsey to take a look at the market penetration of this new device called cell phone, and try to figure out that by year 2000, what kind of market share that we can have for the cell phone? And McKinsey came back in the 1980s, and they find out, they said, okay, we will have about 900,000 subscribers in the United States using cell phone. But by year 2000, the real number was 109 million users of the cell phone. So they were off by over a factor of 100. And the cause of that was, at the time, AT&T took a look at that and saying, okay, we did not need to focus on this new toy. But what happened was, uh, 10 years later, for them to rejoin the market, they had to acquire a company for $12.6 billion. And that's for one company for not to take actions in the, in the cell phone devices. And it's safe to say that the AI technologies has much more broader and also for more profound impact for our economy, for our uh, economic competitiveness, and also the safety of our, and also the, the quality of the life of the citizens. And so that's why there is not to take any action. It's not a choice, and it's going to be way too expensive. And I think to summarize today's uh, uh, panel discussions, it's very clear that we need to look at how do we adequately prepare the AI workforce and how do we enable the AI workforce so that they actually have this culture of lifelong learning and how do we uh, infuse the AI education at all levels, not only at the research universities, it's actually at all degree levels and how do we promote the AI aware awareness among the public so that this is not a scary thing. It's actually something that we want to want to master, we want to manage, and we want to stay way ahead of the game. And how do we continue to drive the AI research frontiers, and how do we proactively look at the AI ethics and policy research, and how do we proactively look at the data management, data access, the data governance and also the data security issues as a state and also as a country and also as uh, academic institutions. And within that context, we look forward to work with each and every one of you and also our partner organizations. And so please let us know if you have uh, uh, activities and you have uh, uh, discussions, you have uh, research initiatives in these areas, we would be really love to work with you. And um, I hope you all enjoy today's uh, uh, AI Policy Forum. And uh, before I close, I want to uh, really uh, thank Dr. 
uh, would you please stand up, actually? <laughs> yeah, so Dr. Mira Sampath, she has spent a lot of time to put together this uh, AI policy forum. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Jane Malachas and also uh, the colleagues here uh, at uh, Rockefeller Institute of uh, Government. Nick, thank you very much. And many of you uh, standing there, Heather, thank you very much for your work. And also my own amazing team, uh, Heather H. and Jackie Spino and uh, here, Vandenberg, uh, many of my wonderful colleagues for pulling, pulling this AI policy forum together. So thank you very much for being here. And we have a reception right here. And please uh, stay and uh, continue the discussion. Thank you.